Now, we're going to be talking about a very important component of what we consider a, a mastery of business architecture, and that is the use of capabilities to control organizational transformation. Now, organizational transformation has two words in it, organizational and transformation. And that implies that you understand both. So we're going to talk for about 40, 45 minutes here, uh, a little bit about some of our uh, mastery uh, level skills in business architecture that we cover in the uh, bit of POC and then elsewhere in some of our training, uh, both in core as well as in that we'll talk about at the end, as well as in our advanced business architecture courses. Um, now, the entire concept of business architecture uh, as a part of architectural practices is aligned with what we call uh, the Bitabach. Uh, and in that uh, Bitabach, well, sorry, that has this Idabach there. So the uh, that was a, uh, an older name for it, but we've changed it to the Bitabach for exactly this reason. And that is the business technology architecture body of knowledge. And the reason is it includes both sides of architecture practices. It includes the business uh, understanding and how do we organize change and how do we uh, convert to a digital business model um, but it also includes the technology side, the digital in business model, right? So the, the goal of this, this session is to really help you navigate your role in understanding capabilities and business capabilities and operating models, how those work, what those look like inside of your company, whether it's a, a government agency or a retail company or a hospital, but then also to learn to use those as an architect to develop transformational agendas and roadmaps and delivery. So we're going to talk about some of the architectural artifacts that will lead to that, but we'll also talk about that sort of core functionality of understanding business capabilities at an advanced level, using that information to transform an existing business or a new business into digital capabilities. Now, first, it's important to understand what those are. The Bitabot, by the way, is an open source body of knowledge hosted in GitHub. So it's free to all of you. You can download it, just check it out from GitHub, and it's all on your laptop or on your servers or whatnot. Uh, it is open source. So remember to contribute. If you can discover something or, uh, or using a technique that's not listed there, go ahead and add it right in. It's a wonderful body of knowledge curated by our board certified architects. Um, Capability models uh, are, are something like a Rosetta Stone. They're, in, in a way, they're kind of a naming convention, right? They're kind of how do we devise and de 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 discover our business in a way. Um, it's very hard to actually understand a business when you look at it from an org chart perspective, right? There's this VP of sales and salespeople, and when there's the CEO, or there's the CIO, right? You would think that all application development and all that content was only related to IT. But when in fact, most of our businesses now uh, run completely on technology, and therefore it is fundamental to all of the operating models of our business. So org models are bad ways to understand a business. They're good ways to understand an organization. But when we want to convert a business, we need to know what that business does and what it needs to do well. So now, if you don't understand your operating model, well, you can't transform it, right? So, and as you, if you're more of a technical architect, a CTO, a, a chief architect, a software architect, even an infrastructure architect, you cannot understand how to use technology to transform your business if you don't know what your business is. Now, that doesn't just mean that you happen to be in the business of selling hamburgers or curing patients or, you know, taking, uh, collecting taxes. It means that you understand that the business, um, it, it has to do a whole bunch of things that are both aligned with that, but also that are shared, right? Every company in the world has to pay their people. Every company in the world prints documents, or most of them. Every company in the world uh, hires and fires and promotes. Every company in the world pays their bills, or they're not a company for very long. So you have all these shared capabilities that we kind of understand, and we don't think, oh, well, you know, we're a hospital, so, you know, we have to be really good at printing documents. But some of those capabilities actually combine to create your business model. And we're going to understand what those businesses are. Um, we use these capabilities in architecture as a 
scope sequencing prioritization engine. We use them to understand what we need to focus on to be able to develop and deliver the best business possible. That means as architects, I can use it for project prioritization. I can use it for investment in technology areas. I can use it for speaking the language of my stakeholders, and I can use it to help understand how to relate those projects and products together to outcomes that my business stakeholders best can, can, can understand as well. So capability model is, is, is really important, but you also have to understand what they are and aren't. Right, because the capabilities are not everything. This is not the perfect deliverable. It's not a silver bullet. And uh, a lot of times we use it like it is one. Um, we're going to talk about how to use capabilities to understand what true effective change is. And this is not a talk show moment. I'm, I'm, this is not a CEO slide. This is a day in and day out thing for every architect in your practice. Software architects need to use it, maybe not as much as business architects, but pretty close right? Um, because I can't know what I'm changing if I don't know what I'm changing. And that is a business concept. Now, we also want to understand the operating model to understand where can we add value? How do we get out of this project chaos? You know, a lot of us get our prioritization from whoever is yelling the loudest. That is not a great strategic prioritization mechanism, right? Um, putting out fires and trying to keep things running doesn't help you to work strategically. So chaos, low impact projects, if you're working on something that doesn't uh, add a lot of value and you know it, um, can be a very demoralizing factor. Um, prioritiz prioritizing the work you need to do comes from and is derived from what the most effective investments for your company will be. So you can think about um, these capabilities as giving you a, basically a, 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 an easy to read understanding where to put your effort. And if you can get your stakeholders to use it, it can create a, a, a schema of the operating model of your strategic uh, activities. Um, it helps you understand your, your partners. It helps you understand the, uh, how your architecture works together with technology architecture. And one of the great things that we're doing in the Bitabank is we're actually creating maps between the business capabilities and the technical landscape and understanding that technology categorization and prioritization activity is critical to us uh, as a business transformation partner. So as you think like an architect, you have to be constantly thinking up and down the stack of strategic change. And uh, business architects and, and often do this quite well. Um, the purpose of the organization doesn't change much. The mission of the organization, vision, things of that nature, its core values, but its capabilities uh, change a little more often to understand, to, especially as we move into a digital age. And we use these capabilities to understand what is strategic and how they relate, right? So we look at a capability model and um, think about what are the core activities that we have to be good at to actually run our business. Now, core activities are things like paying employees, right? Printing documents. You got to do it. It doesn't differentiate you, but you got to do it. Enabling capabilities are ones that help us understand a little bit more about um, what enables our business strategy. Then, of course, our strategic capabilities, and we're going to talk more about this and how you can work with these in the Bitabock and how you can work with these in your organizations. But if you think about your operating model, probably paying employees does not differentiate you. I mean, hopefully everybody pays their employees. Um, but if you think about that capability, it still has to happen and it has to happen on time every time. Otherwise, you can't do your strategic capabilities. Now, your operating model is going to differ. So you will have different types of operating, operating models based on the kind of company you are. Um, and that operating model will most, the differences will mostly fall into the strategic and to a certain extent, these enabling capabilities. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, and how that works, because depending on the type of business you are, you're going to have a lot of different strategies. Of course, if you're an integrated business model, it means that you're like a government agency or you're a, a single company offering a single value proposition, right? So 
Tesla is a good example, right? They they create a car and they sell the car, but they don't have 17 different holding companies uh, that are all different. Now, of course, I can't talk about what Elon's going to do with AI and robots and stuff. So they may turn into another kind of company. Um, allied related, allied unrelated means that you basically have multiple business activities going on. And we'll talk a little bit more about what, what these uh, kinds of business operating models are. But think about this as having a number of different customers, uh, a corporate role and how corporate functions, right? Human people, human capital and how they work, um, IT systems and how those work, and then enabling processes. And this is just some of the advanced concepts that we cover to understand how different kinds of businesses uh, use operating models and how those connect to the kind of core activities of their business. Um, coordinated and um, and unified, diversified, and replicated business models, models have business process and business uh, uh, standardization and integration. So again, you know, Tesla has a very uh, unified process and uh, integration and standardization because everything has to work very closely together. So these unified business models have to work really closely and tightly together across the entire operating model. Now, a diversified operating model or, or business, uh, kind, uh, much like a holding company, you can think of a holding company as uh, one company um, that owns 15 or 20 or 30 other companies um, that each do something different. So you might see a medical uh, a device company, for example, or a medical company that owns, you know, heart monitors and heart uh, MRIs and, you know, medical devices. They might own hospitals. They might own all sorts of different types of business. And that would be a very diversified business. So their business processes would be very diverse across those different companies. And the holding company has to serve all of them. So again, you're, the type of business that you're going to be working on is going to help you uh, understand the capabilities you need to be able to work in these different operating models. Now, why is this important? Again, maybe you're super familiar with this level of business strategy, and maybe you're not. But what capability modeling is going to do, it's going to help you understand the building blocks of these companies and which ones can be duplicated. Again, pay them, uh, almost all holding companies use a centralized HR management system um, because it you don't diversify. You're not. It's not a. It's not a strategic capability for any of the sub companies. Unified business models also have the, the the same kind of support for their employees because that is a generally a non differentiating capability. Except. Uh, I can list, I could actually, I know quite well one organization that we work with a lot in the Chief Architect Forum, we work with a lot in, in ISA, and they are actually a holding company of personnel companies, <laughs> and meaning they they do um, hourly employees and, and uh, you know, kind of staffing company. So they actually are a holding company for different types of staffing companies, and they do have different payroll activities going on because it differentiates those different businesses. So... Again, it, it, notice how it, if I start thinking this way, I'm able to navigate an organization not by who is in power, but by what the company needs to do well. You know, oh, I'm working for a holding company. Oh, I'm working for a, a device manufacturing company. And that's going to tell me what their strategic activities are that I can optimize. And the strategic activities are the things that are the what, right? Again, pay employees doesn't tell me how I'm going to pay my employees. Maybe I send them a check. Maybe I hand them cash. Maybe the auto deposits. Maybe I do that once a month. Maybe I do it every three months, whatever, right? Maybe they're consultants and they invoice me. Capabilities tell us the what we need to do. And it helps us avoid what we call the how trap, right? The how trap is how do you do these things? And that's the implementation detail. A capability is what do we need to do, right? We need to market our product. We need to pay employees. We need to create a product catalog or innovate in the product space. Um, the, 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 the how trap is much more about either business processes, how each of those activities are implemented at our company so they get, get caught up in a lot of detail, 
or they're how good are we? How well do we do those? Right. So part of what we want to talk about is do we do capabilities well? Right. So a capability is what we do. And it includes how we do it in people, how we do it in process, how we do it in technology. Those are the details, but the capability is what we do. So again, the ability acts these details to a degree and allows us to think about how good do we want to be at this? Well, what do we want to do well? Do we want to print documents well, or is that not going to differentiate us? Um, there's been a lot of history put back in this from the task-based things all the way to the, to, you know, to the workers, through the departments, to processes, through industrialization, um, and finally into the information age and finally the post-information age and what we're doing now. We look now at organizations much more as the what's, the components that we want to either insource or outsource. We want to be strategic or, or, or not. And we think about for example, the capability is what the company needs to be able to do to execute its strategy. Now, these are, I honestly think, quite abstract examples. Um, a for-profit retail company needs to be able to market their product in a, their products in a very excellent fashion. They need to be truly competitive at that. A pharmaceutical research company may be able to be less competitive, competitive at marketing their products because they have a different distribution chain. They need to be excellent at researching new medicines. Now, obviously a retail company is not gonna be researching new medicines. So those are a capability that are not shared. One is a shared capability that's strategic to one and not another. One is a non-shared capability, meaning both types of companies don't have it, meaning it's strategic to a particular industry model, pharmaceutical companies in this case. <clears throat> Excuse me. Business capabilities are very demonstrable, right? They have defined inputs and outputs. They don't have to be tangible inputs and outputs. They can be text-based or, you know, physical or virtual or any of those kinds of things, but you can figure out what goes in and what comes out. They are independent of other capabilities and organization boundaries. What that means is you don't have 10 print document capabilities. You only have one. I'm going to measure the company based on how well it prints documents. Now, I don't know why you would do that because, again, it's not a differentiating capability. But they are measurable. I can say this per this company does this really well. This company doesn't. Um, that business value and performance measurement gives you the language of capabilities. It gives you the language of business. So normally we'll talk about whatever our org chart demands us to. We'll go talk to business stakeholders and we'll ask them, what are you working on and why are you doing it? And what can we help you with? And all that kind of thing. What capabilities talk about is what an organization should be working on, whether our company does it or not. And it goes away from the org chart in such a way that it removes the political angle. Okay, you can't get rid of politics and human systems, but it removes that notion of, of, of you know, the the opinion. And it says, look, we can measure the performance of our capabilities compared to the performance of our competitors. So functional capabilities, business capabilities, interactive competencies, organizational capabilities, these are ways of grouping and organizing our business and, and um, uh, technical uh, kinds of interactions, right? So competencies are individual kinds of activities, right? I have functional competencies, I have leadership competencies, and that's an individual thinking. A capability is like an, a competency, but for an organization. So if you manage projects well, you could do that as an individual, but what if you work at a company where the rest of the people don't? Then your company may really not be good at managing projects well, even though you yourself are quite good at it. Now, why is this important? It's because people make up capabilities, right? They're not all automated. Um, and we have to look at how those competencies map into these capabilities. And so the Bitterbuck uses competencies as a, a people tool, as a people thinking, and capabilities as an organizational kind of thinking. Um, so we don't use competency and capability in the same way. Um, now, 
There are lots of things that are our capabilities. Deliver freight, check out shopping, calculate premium, investigate crime. These are all capabilities, right? You probably don't have a lot of retail companies investigating crime, uh, but to a degree you do. I actually, I say that, but I worked with a retail organization uh, that was working with the FBI on uh, cracking down on um, uh, the mafia because of a particular supply chain kind of, they were so large, they bought a lot of things and some of it was stolen. Um, so there's a whole lot of things listed here. Notice that each one comes with a verb and a noun, approve, leave, issue, boarding pass, mark exam papers, collect product. There's one that stands out and you probably have identified it already and that's send XML to Walmart. Notice how in all the other uh, sections, you are looking at effectively an abstract. Uh, it's a, not a how, right? It's not, oh, okay, one customer. Now, if it said send invoice to, to customer or provider or supplier or something like that, that would still be a capability. But send XML to Walmart is way too specific to be a capability. It is a, it's not abstract for all your customers or all your payments or all your deliveries, or all your checkouts, or all your testing, or all your investigations of crime. So capabilities are effectively the what an organization needs to do. Um, they help us provide strategic, strategic level kind of an, a focus, right? They abstract or ignore implementation details. And you, and you saw they were verb, noun combinations, and they always have a verb and they always have a noun. Um, a, a business process, on the other hand, is how. It's tactical. It's how you do that. It's send XML to customer, and you know, it's send document to customer, and then the imp implementation of that business process is sending XML to Walmart, right? It is a specific task-based implementation of either a capability or a series of them. So you can look at capabilities, too, in terms of the quality that they provide to the organization and their maturity. Uh, there'll be plenty of uh, capabilities that we are immature at, and that is perfectly okay. Initial level um, capabilities that are non-strategic, uh, that are non, uh, you know, effective. You want to get to level one, level two, that's perfectly all right for some of those uh, non-differentiating capabilities, especially when we want to mature the ones that differentiate us. And that's the difference between... Um, prioritization and effective leadership and trying to be good at everything, which just doesn't work. So again, when we think about the capability measurement, we want to think about how repeatable and optimized and improved it is, how lean it is effectively. Um, then we want to look at something that, of course, as architects is near and dear to our heart, right? And that is how much digital support do we have? And these heat maps and these differentiating capabilities are our first indicator of where we should put our digital in investment, right? How should I think about investing in our ability to investigate crime or market our product or pay our employees? Um, fully automated capabilities with cross capability integ integration, we tend to call services. We tend to call technology services, right? In many cases, they become just just an expectation of the business, right? So when e-commerce and um, electronic banking emerged, um, those were differentiating capabilities that very few people had. Now it is what we call table stakes, which basically means if you don't have these things, you're considered antiquated and unable to compete. This is true for many of modern employee interactions and customer interactions. It's included in government interactions now. Our societies are beginning to expect a level of maturity in our digital capabilities or our technology services that we have never had before. They get them, they get that expectation from lots of reasons, and we can talk about those separately. But the point being that if you can connect capabilities, you can really hone in on what's changing in your customer experience and your partner experience what's essential to your business model. And then you can start to look at how to mature those across your lines of business, across an enterprise or an extended enterprise. 
Uh, you can understand the business outcomes, how they're measured, when they're achieved, how that impacts your roadmap. If you can't do this, you will struggle continuously to prioritize, uh, stop putting out fires. And more importantly, as architects, you will continuously try to be superhuman, right? You've got to be every place at one time, know everything. And that is not a mature organization. So a capability model um, is organized and nested. It means you've got a big one, you've got a big grouping areas. And you've got um, sub capabilities underneath of it. We'll talk about that nesting here in a minute. They help us in, uh, visualize um, these in a model, right? So we can see how they relate to each other. Um, they help us communicate and navigate this. And, and I really, really want to stress with you, this is not an easy process uh, at, at when you're first doing it. And even later on, how we name things, how we think of things is, is essential to get down in how we work. Because some people call a customer a customer, and some people call them a you know end user or you know a, a student or whatever. Like they they use labels for a manufacturing process, they use labels for a ordering process or a ship shipping process that may not be standard across the enterprise, and therefore you end up on a lot of discussion. Strategic capabilities, core capabilities, and enabling capabilities can all be measured across effectively how we want to run our business. Now, again, operate uh, uh, call center operation, right? Discovering patterns, analyzing hundreds of claims, seamless sharing of secure information, spot emerging technologies. You can see the you can see how this feels, right? It's just, oh, well, you just throw a bunch of stuff at me. So again, unorganized capability models, uh, what you you end up being confused about what do we do for a living? In an organized capability model, you're grouping these based on families of similar capabilities, right? So IT enablement kinds of technology capabilities like deliver uh, projects, or to, that's a change management activity actually, but the point being that um, we, we tend to group infra support infrastructure or you know cloud excellence or things of this nature in a similar capability area. Same goes for selling our product, marketing our product, designing our product. And these can be organized in a kind of overall, what we call value streams. Um, this is a kind of organizational level value stream where we talk about developing and improving our government service, managing our government service demand. So how much demand there is, fulfilling that service, doing it, uh, support processes, partnerships and uh, customers and planning and managing our government service. So that might be the, the minister or the leader or the, uh, the operational leaders uh, activities in the staffing and operational business intelligence. So again, you can see that a whole number of different verbs have been organized now into groupings and these groupings can actually be nested. So you can say, oh, well at the top we manage service demand but that's really made up of a bunch of other capabilities and those level two capabilities, registered client management, information partner management, those are themselves broken out into level three capabilities. And that's things like creating a profile or uh, registering and maintaining a client or uh, man, uh, you know quality authorized approvers, qualify, excuse me, that's a verb, authorized improvers. And these can be nested further. Now, we tend to like threes in humanity. <laughs> so people often say, once you get to three, really prove that you need to get to four, right? So you, you see under 2.1.2, train and qualify clients, they've listed three here, but notice that they haven't done that for every capability. So they've ex they're looking at what's important. And that level one is called a capability family. And level two is called a capability group. Level three is called a specific capability. Now, the specific capabilities are where we get interesting here because as you build this model, you can either go top down or bottom up, right? You can start at the specifics, you can start at the groupings, or you can do kind of both at once. You can use a reference model. So but beware capabilities. Go out and look up the capability for the type of company you are dealing with. There's a whole bunch of them out there. Do not copy and paste it, please. Just use it as a reference model <laughs> because you want the conversations, you want the dialogue. 
You use this to create families and generic capabilities and specific capabilities at the different levels. Um, and you might start at the level one in a top-down approach, or you might start at the uh, level three in a, um, in a, a bottom-up approach. It's perfectly fine to work in both directions at once. Again, as you create capabilities families, this is going to help you navigate all these arguments that people have. And this is a, a difficult process, but if you want to navigate change, you have to be able to navigate capabilities. Again, I'm not going to read out all of these because this is a part of some of our advanced training, and we have cards and canvases for this kind of stuff in the bit of buck. Um, if you're interested in how to do this, these details are in the business capability card on the bit of buck, and I'll try to show it to you when we get to the description of core. Um, again, you can run all sorts of kind of workshops here. These are great for digital transformation because you know conducting patient screening and making outbound contacts are becoming automated. So when, so I know it got into a lot of detail about capabilities, but these level three capabilities are the ones we say, ooh, if we could automate that, it would save us five hours of, of, a day and it would make our customers twice as happy. And this ability to begin thinking not of digitization, but how do we create a digital operating model is the essence of our transformation. You, as the architect, are there to help navigate this transformation, but also help them think. Because again, you may have a, con a conduct patient screening and your nurses and your, your, your um, you know, frontline staff are all talking about, oh yeah, that has to be this manual thing and that manual thing. And you're able to turn this into uh, you know, a, an automated functionality from when they registered to get the appointment, right? Or watch data, you know, from your uh, online healthcare uh, materials that the customer can submit. Um, a capability model allows us to understand all of these working verbs and nouns that it really tells us what it does and what its value is. Again, I'm not going into detail right now about how to do this, but what we want to do is then turn this into a transformation activity, right? We want to look at the business necessity, the strategic support, the com uh, competitive advantage, and understand which ones of those to change in a transformation. The advantage, the strategic support, the essential, and the business necessity tells us which ones are absolutely important to our fundamental competitive direction. Um, so we use these capabilities models to heat map things. Notice that this is a, has the, the blue and the orange and the yellow and the green to describe which ones are truly st uh, strategic and which ones are more advantage capabilities. You can use multiple uh, levels if you want in your org. I suggest keeping everything to three or four. Otherwise, nobody knows what the colors mean. Um, but again, that significance of impact allows you to prioritize what goes in your roadmap. And you want to think about transformation as capability transformation. And this is what's so important and why these are so powerful in organizational transformation initiatives. Because again, it doesn't matter what you invested in. It matters in what changed. So org transformation and measurements are all about how deeply did you actually impact the financial the operational, the people-based processes and, and technologies in a capability. Now, of course, you got to pay for that. You got to consider revenue. You got to consider uh, which ones are essential in making money and paying people and whatnot. Um, but you can also consider performance assessment, right? Capability efficiency versus effectiveness. Um, we'll go into a little bit more of that as we start talking about road mapping. Now, as a uh, <clears throat> as I finish off here, I want to talk about clarity, right? Don't talk about whether it's important. Talk about its performance. You want to think about its measures because you don't want to get into stakeholder debates and arguments and screaming matches. You want to get into how how do we measure its performance? How do we measure its activities? How do how much does it help us compete? Um, and that is not a, a review of the people doing it. It is a review of whether that's important to our business and our business model. As you get into this, you'll start to understand how to do better heat mapping 
and heat mapping logic and be able to understand how to look at capabilities and um, which ones support effectiveness versus which ones afford, uh, um, um, support our um, efficiency. Right, so there's some things we want to do cheaply, and there's some things we want to do effectively in the business world. And you'll see heat maps like this in terms of where do we want to put our investment, where do we want to put our uh, change initiatives, where should architects focus their efforts, right? Which ones how are most uh, uh, coupled to digital enablement and digital transformation, and this allows us to actually create a kind of target heat map where looking at our effectiveness and our efficiency tells us what the importance of that is, right? So absolutely essential advantage or strategic capabilities where we want to put a lot of effort um, or we have a lot of effectiveness that we need to achieve is, is where we use this in road mapping and transformation. So it's value contribution and its performance assessment is a solid method for delivering on business capability transformations. Um, you'll find a lot of this in our, uh, in our beta box now. So we've got lots of tools listed here and you can click on those. You can also find a significant amount of this, uh, activity going directly into our beta box and downloadable in, in, uh, spreadsheets and tools and canvases. And I'll show you briefly, um, why we do it this way, because again, what we're trying to do is connect uh, the practice of architects to the overall uh, effectiveness of the, you know, uh, individual architects to the overall effectiveness of the, um, in, uh, the the architecture group. Now, the, let's see here, where's my other screen? There it goes. So the Bitamock itself is a large body of knowledge and you'll see business capabilities, road mapping, and a set of other um, tools in there, things like investment prioritization and planning. And you'll find a lot of this transformation thinking in areas like this uh, value categorization and thinking, uh, capability and business case. Um, and that will connect to transformation agendas in your strategy, planning, transformation, utilization, and decommission in both IT and in business architecture. So again, how we connect how we understand our business and where to put our effort to our uh, actual technology initiatives um, is, is one of the core architecture skills. And as we're, we're talking about that, we're going to be talking about the launch of the architecture core, uh, latest architecture core class in, um, uh, in Asia. So we're actually pushing out our, our latest core. And I'm just gonna show you the actual, a little bit of little slides there, a little preview. This is, a, this was, the, I've, I've been teaching this now for a, a little while. And so have our other instructors. And it it is actually a transformational class. And the reason is, is because we don't focus just on the skills you need. We, we marry the skills you need as an architect to succeed with tools and techniques. And, and don't think of them as, canvases or, or or a tool that you would buy, but a technique that you would apply to apply your skills and that you can use like de deliverables, like business capabilities, like business models, like customer journeys to actually augment your technology delivery quality. So you can actually look at things like decision records and architecturally significant requirements and map those back to some of these more business-driven programs. Now, the, the power there is that you're going to follow an entire pathway from business idea to delivery. And you're going to follow that pathway, what we call the red thread. And this, this I've taken lots of students at all sorts of different levels of experience, all from CTO all the way down to literally college graduate through this journey and is a fundamentally different way of looking at architecture. It uses all the competencies in the ISA competency model, but what it does is it allows you to focus those on the essential differentiated skills, the ones that are gonna make you a unique architect. I mean, this will make you fundamentally different than the people that you work with. It's not like other kinds of training that are gonna just teach you a, a framework. This is about how to make you a great architect. And I guarantee you, that if you follow these methods from business and customer, innovation, stakeholder, uh, architecture and design, 
that you will actually get results that, that are repeatable and demonstrable, uh, demonstrably different than your peers. This is going to make you more hireable. Now, I can't, I can't speak to every company in the world, except for to say, I've, I've been working with some of the top thought leaders, you know, Grady Booch, um, Martin, you know, Martin Fowler, the C chief architects from Fortune 100s. These are the skills that architects need, right? They need them to succeed. Whether you're a software architect or you're an information architect or you're going to be, you want to be an enterprise or chief architect. What we do in core is we walk you through an understanding of business and what businesses are and how they have customers and how they interact with their customers or um, in government agencies, their citizens or their primary beneficiaries. Um, we then look at the operating models of companies and understand how they function through business capabilities. We talk about value and how value is characterized and categorized, and then how that translates into a roadmap. Now, maybe you get pulled into an architecture, you know, after the project is started, and that that that's where a lot of us got started. But that fundamental thing that comes up when that happens is, man, I wish I would have gotten invited there earlier, because I would know why some of these bad decisions or good decisions are being made. This is going to give you the skills to get invited to those earlier meetings right? To understand what decisions were made before this project got kicked off. And what's important is, as we teach you then the more traditional uh, architecture descriptions, architecture techniques for describing uh, and views and viewpoints and designs, requirements, decision records, and structural design like patterns and reference models, this is going to change the way you think of structural design in technology. It's a fundamentally different approach. You'll, it's never been all put together in this way before. And it's going to allow you to actually do this even at the, the, the smallest solution level, much less at the enterprise level. If you duplicate this across your architects, business solution, information infrastructure, et cetera, you will have a practice that actually competes with some of the top architecture practices in the world. Uh, we're teaching you rigorous assessment techniques. We're teaching you the skills and agility in, in more traditional waterfall places. Basically, what we're teaching you is how to succeed as an architect, regardless of the employer you're working at. Now, not every employer is going to use every aspect of this course and it, when you start, right? So not all employers are created equal. But by knowing these things, you will be more successful and able to move between employers more easily in a more uh, powerful way. Bring success everywhere you go instead of expecting the organization to bring success to you. And that's always a partnership, but engagement models and how, uh, and how we think about architecture practices are included in here with some real world techniques for scaling out your, your um, and duplicating your success, regardless of the organization that you end up working in. So that's the intro to ISA core and what we're gonna be launching there. Um, after this session. So we're very excited about that. This is previewed by our Arc for Dev class. It's previewed by our uh, architecture skills class, which covers our competency models, a bit, bit of a step into core. So remember, core is a rigorous class, uh, but we do have some stepping stone courses to help you get there. And always remember the Bitavoc is there to help guide you, uh, to help answer your questions and ISA uh, is here to support that. We thank ATD for its many, many years of partnership. And uh, that's it for me today.